Hey everybody, uh, welcome to a, uh, another episode of the Deep Watch Overwatch podcast. Um, got another interesting kind of conversation uh, for y'all today to, to walk through some some uh, conversation topics that we think will be, uh, uh, we know they're interesting to us, so we thought we'd sit down and share them with y'all. Uh, first and foremost, I'm really excited to introduce uh, two new members to uh, the Deep Watch Fold. Uh, I've got Chris Checo to my far right, who is the, uh, the global head of artificial intelligence over here at Deep Watch. I've uh, been here for uh, a hot minute. Uh, and then directly to my right, I've got Trey Ford, who is our new chief information security officer. I've uh, been here for even less of a hot minute. Uh, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves first, give a, kind of a quick background um, on who they are uh, and, and what, they, what they've uh, experienced, what they've done. Uh, and then we can uh, start talking a little bit about, specifically we're going to deal with conversations on AI and ML, uh, kind of what those what those letters are, right, uh, in, in either some very deep technical terms, if we want to go there with Chris, some very basic layman's terms, if you, between myself and Trey, if we want to hit in on that. Uh, but uh, then moving that into kind of what's this going to do to security? What's this going to do to analysts? What's this going to do maybe from a compliance standpoint as well? Uh, so I'll turn it over to Chris on just quick intro. Tell us a little bit about yourself and go from there. Thanks, Dale. Um, so Chris Checo, I've been at Deep Watch for uh, a hot minute, three months, um, and uh, spent the last six years at AWS um, working in their generative AI um, innovation center and machine learning solutions lab uh, and delivery. But the last 25 years actually in the AI and ML space, uh, just delivering practical applications to customers uh, all around artificial intelligence and machine learning. Howdy folks, Tree Ford. I'm uh, the CISO for Deep Watch. I've been here for a fraction of a hot minute. I think today's day 13. Uh, I joined from a private equity firm. Uh, been around the security industry for uh, the last 20 something years. Cybersecurity is what I do, what I know, and uh, I'm here to be an extension of you. I'm customer zero and I get to partner with the CISO and the, uh, the security operations community in our customer base to help develop and cultivate the direction that uh, we're headed. Excited to be here. Glad you're here. Uh, need another, uh, need another Southern accent. So, <laughs> On that point, uh, Ken, the first thing we want to talk about a bit, again, is obviously acronyms are everywhere in security. Uh, you can't turn around without tripping over one of them. Uh, and the, the big one that everyone's discussing and, and some of us have had talks about is AI or artificial intelligence or machine learning and ML and LLMLs and uh, neuromaps and all these other things that we, we keep hearing these terms Um some of us, we immediately go to data and the next generation. We know that that's not real. But what, Chris, do you mind, like, what is this stuff, in your opinion? Like, what is it really? What is it not? Sure. Um, so you could really think about um, AI as a, a whole category of other subdivisions. Um, so artificial intelligence is anything that can mimic human behavior. Um, it, it can be anything from your spam filter uh, to, you know, your iPhone opening automatically, right? Simple things like that. Uh, machine learning under the covers, which is like kind of the next big concentric circle, is um, uh, taking typically structured information and applying algorithms to that structured information for doing things like predictive um, modeling. Um, within that, there's deep learning. So deep learning then takes uh, uh, machine learning to the next level to then look at unstructured data. So think of this as unstructured de text, um, video, audio, et cetera. Um, and then within that, you have generative AI, right? Which is, um, uh, you know, the, the word or the term of the day, um, which is then generating content out of, um, right, the masses of information that's available um, uh, openly. Jeff, thank you for that. So I'll actually turn the question over to you coming, coming off of that. Um, so from a, a CISO perspective, from a compliance perspective, um, we know that if we're, say, for example, doing a lot of generation of data from a gen AI perspective, uh, do, you, do you foresee anything coming down compliance-wise on specific data protections for about, like, say, for example, data poisoning or sure, there, the concerns on those things? There's going to be a mountain of uh, compliance and security ramifications for generative AI. When I think about this, I think first about where ground truth is coming from. How are we sourcing data? We always worry about the diaspora of data. We have regulatory data custodial responsibilities. Behind that is keeping that information fresh. So we've all dealt with follower databases propagating and not being protected the same. We worry about production data leaking into dev and test. Well, generative AI has turned into a space where 
we're going to hemorrhage data in a way we never have. You're typing an email at Outlook or in Gmail. Autocomplete, while very simple, is a starting place. But when you think about Grammarly and some of these other supportive mechanisms where all this data is streaming to yet a third party, now you've created some processor relationships that the organization may not be aware of, may not be tracking, may have been plugged in. Let's take a different direction. So you're using Copilot or one of these other tools that's helping you write code. The genesis of this content, uh, the source code being committed that was sourced from generative AI, we don't know that we have intellectual property ownership of that, and it needs to be tagged and tracked. Further, the ground truth those systems were trained on was mostly open source, which means you've now pulled pirated software code from other repos that may force you to open source entire bodies of repos. I don't know that I know a whole lot about AI, but I'm just getting into this, and I'm telling you there's mountains of things we still haven't figured out. I mean, I, I can go back to the old days of initial code gen components, and, and we, we talk... We talked before about, um, it was, so we did a talk actually uh, with uh, Marcus Hutchinson uh, a while back, and, and one thing that he mentioned that I, I thought was absolutely hilarious, um, but he was talking about how he had asked it to create a very simple web app, um, and it did. Like, he put it into a chat GBT, told it the type of functions he was looking to, for it to provide. It gave him the code. It all compiled, worked appropriately, or compiled maybe showing by age, but it, it ran, right? Um and then he came back and looked at it, and he was able to exploit it in about 30 seconds uh, because it had very well-known vulnerabilities associated to it. And that. the corpus of training data is generational, and it's narrow. I mean, when we start moving towards private LLMs and private models for trading and the other things that we're going to do, and I'm quickly out of my depth, we've got to think about how to manage that. There's the sovereignty and the life cycle of that. And there's the question of the safety of the models. How are you training? Is it hallucinating? How are you grounding and tuning the models as it evolves? But thankfully, we've got an adult here to help deconflict some of this. <laughs> what do you think about when you think about this? Well, from... it's the first time I've been called the adult in the room. <laughs> Welcome Great. to the party. <laughs> um, but seriously, I, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. So there's going to be a, a whole series of, um, of needs in terms of uh, data protection. I think one of the biggest challenges are going to be the vulnerabilities that are out there. So you, I think you, know, you mentioned data poisoning. Um, that's certainly going to be one. Model takeover is going to be another um, right, where they're just out there, yeah, le leveraging those models um, for, for bad, not for good. Um, and then the systems themselves, as you're putting them into place, uh, right, generative AI engines, um, I, won't, I won't go into detail, but um, somebody exposed uh, one the other day where they went into one of these uh, public generative AI engines and were able to actually create code, malicious code through that generative AI engine that can then be used, right, for or bad activities um, and injected right back into the right into that site. So, yeah, there there are a number of challenges that we're going to have, um, and there's got to be some regulation at some point around uh, around this. It, it it again, I'm sh kind of showing my age, and, and maybe you you've heard of this one, Chris. Maybe a little outside of your your realm, but have you ever dealt with or heard of Little Johnny Tables? <laughs> no. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So like, it, it's an older uh, it's an older joke or an older an older term in security, and it's basically a, a SQL injection attack, like being able to introduce a, a drop line for a database uh, directly into some form of connectivity that you're going to put in place. So it's, it's a, you know, hey, uh, I just introduced you to little Johnny Tables. It means you basically just lost your database, uh, is what the joke means. Um, and I may or may not have been to a, a DerbyCon a while ago when DerbyCon was still a thing where uh, a, a, a guy in front of me had actually re-engineered his QR code uh, to, upon scan, to introduce a, a, a SQL table drop command and drop the entire DEF CON or a DerbyCon uh, attendee list. Um, but I, I, I bring that up only on, like you mentioned, like model takeover or, or other pieces, or, or we're hearing more like prompt engineering and we're trying to institute protections into these things to stop people from creating malicious code but is in your top of mind is there anything we could do that could stop that that injection back in of whether it's a poison pill or a drop table or like absolutely yeah no absolutely um uh look i think uh no matter what the system whether it's generative ai or or standard ai or even you know um a bi system you have to have those those protections in place so you have to make sure your systems are solid um, uh, go metric, you know, compiled, uh, uh, comment. No, no, it's, but it's true, right? You've got to make sure things are in binaries where they're right. Or they're less susceptible to, uh, to those types of, 
um, uh, malicious activities um, and uh, make, making sure that, you know, um, standards like, you know, ports aren't being opened for right for raw activities that anything uh, doesn't have any sort of uh, uh, backdoor reverse entry, if you will. Um, we've seen things like, you know, search bars, generative AI search bars where you can type things in um, and you can create a backdoor right into right to system. So those types of things really need to be um, thought about um, now more than ever. So we, we, we've talked a bit about kind of the the basics, right? The, 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 the hierarchy effectively. Um, we talked a little bit about already taking advantage of them. Sorry. Um, but let's let's roll back a bit on uh, what do we know that that's actually real uh, from a security stance perspective? Because we, again, we like to make the joke on, you know, MDR means this and XDR means this and AI means this and ML means this. And, and the, again, these acronyms mean something to everybody. And the, they've been around for a long time. Um, so we, we're in a new age of people being able to utilize them. But, but lots of folks, especially on the marketing side, I have claimed these technologies that have been running or operating for a very long time. Um, do you, what do you, and actually Chris, I'll, I'll go to you on this one. Like, is that, how much of that is going to catch up with them knowing that that wasn't really real at that point in time? Um, meeting the, uh, the AI was not really real. Well, like the, 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 say for example, if we look at, um, Somebody like like from an ML perspective, um, I'll give you an example that I know of like, oh, a, a early version of detection and protection that we would say that I think would apply to like an ML perspective um, is uh, some of the old, uh, uh, not, not the DDoS, but um, what is it called with uh, um, being able to uh, mutate from a DNS perspective? Uh, oh, FastFlux DNS? Yeah, it was FastFlux was one of them, but there's, there's, polymorphic there's malware, another one. There's that was, yeah. Well, the polymorphism more so than anything else. Um, but the ability to try to detect polymorphic activity is an, an early form of, of ML. Mm -hmm. um, and lots of people talked about it, but up until recently, I don't think too many people are actually able to do it. Um, and that's where I'm kind of going. Like, is this technology just now hitting mainstream where we can really use it? Or is it old enough that some of these older claims were potentially true? I think some of it is uh, old enough where some of the claims were potentially true. I think that um, there's probably a um, a line uh, between what was full production automated versus what was being used in the background. Meaning, if you think about um, some of the basics like root cause analysis and anomaly detection, right? Root cause analysis um, could have been used by you know threat hunters or others uh, in order to identify just that what were the root causes, what were the you know, the things that um, allowed a threat to occur. Um, anomaly detection could be more um, uh, automated where you could actually, you know, set thresholds, uh, control limits to use anomaly detection uh, to identify, you know, clusters that were now anomalous for, uh, right, for any given situation. Um, I think when you get to machine learning um, as well, I think some of the data, while well, lends itself to, uh, large scale machine learning where you can actually do some predictive or, or identification through these models. Um, I think uh, in many cases, right. And you know, this better than I, the data is messy and it's very difficult to create um, clean enough data to push through those, some of those models uh, to, to do those detections, uh, maybe as well as, as some would have hoped. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Eh, sort of. Um, <laughs> but I mean, cause I, I'm thinking DDNS is the one that I was, Try to think up more so than than the DDoS. That's where, sorry, off by a letter in the alphabet. Um, but the like I've seen. I, I guess the thing that I would I would point at is from a, a market stance. Um, and again, being in this for a while, uh, we've always been talking about uh, predictive. We've always been talking about preventative. We're we're getting ahead of things from an analysis standpoint. And oh, we'll you know we'll stop the actors at the door before they get in because we know what they're going to look like. Um, and really what I'm hearing from you more so than anything else that was working or was effective in the past and is more effective today than, than other things. And again, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but it is more of the, the analytic predictive of we have known bad samples and we've been able to detect the pattern and build off of the pattern or make assumptions of that pattern 
uh, to look forward, not anything from a, a net new or from a almost like a, a, an activity pattern. Does that make sense at all? I think so. Um, I'll try to answer it better this time. Um, no, I don't think you answered it wrong. Well <laughs> no, it was a great time. answer, but I, yeah. I don't know that yeah. was the, the prompt was dialed in. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get my own prompt engineering going. <laughs> there we go. Well, that, that'll be a whole new field of study. Like, that's yeah. Try to get my kid involved in that. Um, let's see. Um, just trying to think of how to how to address this. I, I'll give you an example. Yeah, right. Please. So, um, like when I, uh, you look at some of the older technologies that, that have been out there that have been very, very effective. Um, one of the ones that I used to be pretty heavily involved in was more of like a, a cloud-based AV, uh, a where we would look at, at known hashes of known bad files and publish that list, right? right. Uh, and so whenever you, a file was downloaded before it was allowed to be executed, you'd hash it in some other different way and then throw it up to, hey, do we know anything about this? Yes, no. And so we would look at kind of a form of, of ML would be, okay, well, what would that file look like if we just added a space? What would that file look like if we added an A or an uppercase? So you had a kind of a set number of changes, effectively a playbook that you would add to that deconstructed file to then rehash and upload associated to that. So one file could very quickly become, you know, from one hash or effectively three hashes from checksum, MD, SHA, right, type of thing. Uh, could become 60, could become 80, could become you know, 360 uh, different versions. And that, to me, that was an early kind of form of this. Um, and we could claim that we were doing it, but I don't know of too many other things that could have been real from that predictive stance. That's where I was trying to go. Yes. Uh, so it's a, uh, it's a bit of a cat and a mouse game, right? Because as the, um, the threat actors have, this, have the access to the same tools that we do, right, on the other side. Um, and so, uh, what I mean by cat and mouse game is if you look at early days of phishing, right, uh, threat actors would be using natural language process to create phishing attacks, um, or, you know, uh, or quoting them by hand. Um, and, uh, on the other side, we may be using natural language processing to, um, identify those phishing attacks or predictive modeling to your point with right checksums and, and hashes and things of that nature. Um, now there's generative AI, right? And generative AI can do what NLP did in, right, um, orders of magnitude, larger scale, faster, et cetera, um, with far less effort. Well, what are we going to use on the other side, right? Now we've got um, new types of, uh, you know, techniques within generative AI and deep learning, um, uh, in this case, probably deep learning to identify, uh, you know, potential phishing attacks. So this cat and mouse game is, um, you know, uh, the threat actors in some cases are um, moving beyond what detections can do. And then we on the other side um, have to move beyond what the threat actors can do. Okay. Pivoting a little bit, uh, and Trey, this one's for you. Um, so one thing we know is happening, um, so kind of moving away from the past and moving more towards the now perspective, because um, we keep talking about generative AI. Uh, so let's let's play with that one for a second. Um, what can we see or what do you think is from a, a policy perspective, from a training perspective, like a, as a CISO, how do you up level like your phishing or malware training for your, for your, your workers? Because we know generative AI is going to start taking some of the standard like grammatic, you know, heading like the, the Google translate problems out man you threw a grenade at me because uh I, I have a principal position on i i hate fishing training i don't know the simulation training always yields the level of value there's correlations or studies like there, there there's value to be had i don't want to knock that entire population but when i think about where to create value uh when i think about ai ml deep learning some of these other resources um i think there's a couple of things we have to start with kind of a philosoph framing as defenders we get the second move like we get to govern and we get to prepare but what we're responding to by definition is responsive. And so with that in mind, the models that we're driving, the data sets we're correlating, the decisions we're making in the investigative process that we're looking to automate and accelerate are only as good as the models and the design and the data that we fed to it. So there's a lot of work that goes into normalizing, cleaning up, and then preparing what those correlations are. To your point, the magic of pulling in these technologies is going to say, all right, it takes my defenders this long to get to these different platforms, the different, these different data sets, and they're really hard to get to. They're really hard to trend. They're really hard to identify deviations or correlational behaviors. 
as it turns out definitively, that's exactly what these technologies do exceptionally well. There's other things that turn into, to your point about user education, I think there's a partnership. So I'll pick on DLP. I think DLP as a technology is woefully broken. What we tried to do early on with regex and trying to get endpoint controls and network controls, and it was great to sell a lot of hardware and software, but it wasn't actually a solution because it wasn't hard to iterate past whatever the signatures were cultivated to be. What this turns into now is one, the Gen, I, Gen AI, I keep mispronouncing that, it's terrible. Gen AI and some of these other technologies in the space are one, going to be adaptive enough to understand and synthesize. No, this is 99.9997% exactly what you did, but you added a space, see what you did there. Now we get to make decisions based upon roles of volatility or sensitivity of data. But now we have the ability to have an automated coach check and say, yo, Neil, I see that you're trying to send this out. This is the 14th document of this type you have sent. This is in direct violation of all of our policies. This is the 14th time we've contacted you. If your account locks here in a minute, you get a phone call, don't panic. <laughs> but like, you still you, panic. Well, I'm, I'm yeah. pulling the string a long way, and this is the Terminator speaking, right. but for the sake of argument, what we have the ability to do is allow for some level of automated response and user coaching and adaptive response that is not going to involve the analyst, but you still need, I'm going to make the adult joke again, you need an adult in the room to guide these systems and to make sure that the prompts, the responses are correct, proportional, grounded, all these sorts of things. And so I think there's still going to be a deep partnership but some of the really deep grunt work on routine alerts, I think is going to go down drastically. Am I way off in my thinking? No, not at all. Um, you're definitely going to need that that work. Um, generative AI needs a baseline in order to learn from. Um, somebody has to create that baseline. Somebody has to create that original content um, or we're just going to stagnate, right, at the end of the day. I mean, we keep using the term. And, and I, uh, so I, I come true story on, um, uh, so last week I've got, I've got a, I've got a son. Won't say how old, um, but he had to uh, he had to shadow. It was a shadow day uh, in school, uh, and he was supposed to shadow somebody else. And somehow the, the poor kid ended up having to shadow me for work. Um, and this is Friday of last week. Um, so I, I bring the story up because I've got him doing like some competitive reviews, like you know, dig into this or let's go learn about this thing. Um, and he, he we were reading through some stuff, and he's like, "How does it?" A model hallucinate I'm like I right, what are you what are you talking about and so I tried to explain like you know generative AI is about the like your point Chris like it's about the generation of data uh, and that a, a hallucination is it's just creating something that it's cobbling together from disparate sources that it doesn't know to be true or false but like most social engineering it's just presenting it with enough confidence to where you're gonna eat it hook line or sinker um, and so I'm like the, the idea or some of the security ramifications of, of hallucination or how are we going to identify hallucinations or how could thinking about it from a, from a, from a user perspective, could I force a hallucination as part of that process uh, in, in walking through a training regimen would actually be kind of interesting. Um, it can be used as a pretty good training tool um, of, force it to hallucinate, push someone through some some email through automated responses, and then, to your point, kind of string them along. I, I guess where I'll, I'll end this piece on um, is, again, I like simple things. I like messing with people. I'm a much better social engineer than I am a, a technical hacker these days. Um, but I know from my experience from dealing with CISOs and dealing with compliance policies, one of the favorite things that was ever done and continues to be done is that internal phishing campaign on how many how many folks could we get uh, and and cheating to to know different things about the organization to do that. Does Gen AI like remove the varsity level? For that? Oh my gosh! Let's just be evil for a hot second. All right. So, what are you most likely to click a link? Like you're going to be on your mobile. You're not looking at the full machine. You don't have view source right there available. Um, AI has the ability to, okay, so if I were to harvest information off of MDM and I don't know what telemetry your company might be pulling, and for the sake of argument, I know that you're generally on social media and maybe scanning email when you shouldn't be, when you're on the can taking your 3 a.m. constitutional, and so you're sitting there scanning things, and if you see something that looks important, you're going to click it. I'm going to take all variability out of it. I know right when to drop that email to you, and it's going to pop up when you're on the can. Like, that's not fair. You're going to click it. The majority of, I want to say this, even as a CISO, the majority of the uh, phishing test campaigns I've fallen for 
I did on my mobile, hundred percent. I was distracted. I shouldn't have been like, I should have been focusing on what I was doing, processing email. But I'm also going to argue that the fail isn't clicking the link. It's about authenticating through the fake portal and donating your credentials to creating a session. But backing all the way back up, catching people in their most compromised and vulnerable states. There's more work, I think, on the defense side where we can remove layers of this. And I think that's where the value is. We can shorten, I hate to go back to Boyd, but that OODA loop, the observe, orient, decide, act loop of these are the predicating circumstances for these bad scenarios to happen. This is what they look like. And I think we can disrupt aspects of those, those failure modes. And that's what I'm most excited about is we've spent so much time looking to detect right of boom as quickly as we can to contain and drive towards a resilient mindset of faster return to service. I think we can actually shorten the path to interruption in the course of boom. We might be able to defuse more. So what I just heard, and Chris, we have a, a product we now need to build, um, is a we'll call it a learning process um, that looks at telemetry data from people's phones uh, <laughs> that removes <laughs> them Boom from the plop. ability okay. to 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 click on an email or to look at text messages or such and such when it is a certain time they make a certain distance <laughs> and they the phone is now at a certain angle uh as they oh, are proceeding down constitutionals i've got to be careful of so, the uh, prescriptive examples yeah i think that was that was fantastic <laughs> i don't have a problem with that but i i do think uh, honestly that that leads to an entirely different conversation and, and topic that we can't really have in in this space but the we, we talk, uh, so this will run us into our, our, our kind of our, our last piece that we want to talk to is just on, on the effect of SOC analysts and, and what we see with this yep. and, and how's it going to impact that. Um, but I'll, I'll throw this in just as a, not as a conversation started over here, but something to think about for later of, we see the news, uh, not getting political in any way, shape or form, but we've seen the conversations recently legislatively around TikTok. Uh, we see the conversations on just being on the phone constantly, the burnout associated to the analysts, the burnout to ourselves on on you know being on the phone or on the online all the time. Um, it would be interesting to have a, a larger conversation of letting it actually help us a bit. Of hey, I'm going to turn your notifications off, like uh, unless it meets this criteria, not just as a defensive measure for ourselves or for our organizations. Uh, from having bad things happen from a, a, an attack perspective, but from the, it sounds Orwellian and it kind of is, but you know, hey, eat an apple and put this thing down uh, type of, of scenario. Yeah, that comes back to situational awareness, right? Um, and you can bake that into, right, into these algorithms to understand that context, right? If you're if you're using your phone at a certain time of day, um, right, or certain location, um, they know you're on your mobile. You can put context around that to say. Hey, anything that, you know, could even be uh, either slightly important or slightly malicious, we're not going to show you right now. We don't want you to respond to that to, to that type of, you know, uh, email or notification at that point of, yeah. in the day. Again, I, I in my head, that sounds really good. And then the more I think about it, I'm like, no. <laughs> but also from a security, like, like from, from, again, our job as a, as an MDR managed detection response provider, like I need an ability to override that of it is this time. Yeah, you may you may be, you know, checking your constitutional, but this is actually important. You need to be aware of this. Like that those level of gates are that's a that's a that is a very interesting thought experiment uh that could get really cool really quick. Um from a a again backing off of that but but looking at this, like one of the things that we the hype around AI and ML is always about it makes these decisions based upon this data faster and quicker and better. Um, and we know that there's some real value to that. Um, but I, one of the things we want to, to post the question of to, to the group and, and to this, this effectively to the industry is are SOC analysts, one, are they going away? Two, are, are their roles being reduced or their roles being changed? It, as they go away or don't go away. I'm sorry, I heard your first question as asking about SOC analyst one, like entry level SOC analyst. No, 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 no. I'm with you now. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. yes. That's inappropriately yeah. laughing. Uh, th thank you for the clarification. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that actually does feed directly into the, the point of this. Like, so are SOC analysts in general going away? Uh, if they're not going away, or even if they are going away, how is that role going to change? Or what do we see moving 
short term, long term. Uh, and then third and kind of finally, at what point do we expect the Borg to show? Okay, so we get it first? Go okay. for it. Face. Listen, um, I would argue that it's not going away. It's going to get more exciting. Uh, listen, handling a million fishing tickets in a row is a rough way to live your life. Uh, the SOC analysts, especially at the entry level, it's a grind. And these are good people fighting a good fight, and they're literally feeding themselves to a chipper, tearing through a mountain of tickets nonstop. Imagine a universe where... And I'm going to get over my skis for a hot second, but there's human reinforced learning processes and constitutional processes. And then there's the spectrum between probabilistic and deterministic outcomes with all of these engines. If the SOC, the entry level SOC, the first entry level SOC seat is literally doing a handful of things, we're coaching them to make sure that they know how to process the ticket correctly. But now their workload has dynamically shifted to now it's doing some human reinforcement to make sure that I'm not hallucinating or making mistakes as a model. Now you're moving closer towards hunting and more creative work because you're partnering with the machine and we're not teaching you the foundations of how to spot a fish or how to look up a URL or the history of the ASN or any other things that attributes for a domain. We're making sure you know aspects of the craft and as your skills develop, we're giving you more and it doesn't require meetings weekly with the boss. It's how oh, you've unlocked this next level. You've unlocked this next level. So we're not only cultivating your skills faster, but be given more dynamic work quicker because you've partnered with the machine. So the stuff that's easily automated, it's first making sure you're sane and then you're now working to make sure it's sane and there's a partnership with give and take. I don't know if this is rational or possible. I have to imagine it is, but my imagination paints a picture of a sock life that's improved. It's more dynamic. It's richer. It understands when you're at a high focus point. It knows you're just back from lunch. You're probably carp heavy because you always are. You're going to droop and your precision's going to go down. So we're going to do a handful of things that are less damaging to customers and to the algorithm writ large. But it, it, it has understandings of that. So it's going to play to you as a human. It's going to play to you as a professional and it is going to grow your skills. I imagine a world that makes sock life better and more interesting. I would agree. D dial me in on any of my, <laughs> my messaging here, but <laughs> no, like, that, I, that's my, my world. I would agree. And so um, I think you used a couple of, I think really important points to underscore. Uh, you mentioned pr probabilistic and deterministic and that's, that's key. Um, and I would stick on top of that investigative. So if you think of this as a funnel investigative being on top, probabilistic second, deterministic third. Um, what we're doing uh, today is we're doing investigative um, and then moving to probabilistic and then doing something right, offsetting you know, or dispositioning um, a case, for lack of better terms. In the future, and, and we're here now really, um, we're getting there now, we're going from investigative to probabilistic to deterministic. Deterministic then becomes a rule, right? This now becomes your spam filter. This becomes your auto spell check that have that undifferentiated lifting can now go away. And so you're using ML then at, at you know, uh, multiple ends of the spectrum to say, anything that's deterministic, we should be able to automate. We should not have to have a uh, SOC analyst writing a report for, you know, the same um, threat they've detected 150 times. A machine should be able to do that. In fact, they shouldn't even have to touch that because it should be able to, um, if it's high probability, um, automate that entire process through and through, which means they'll be doing more investigative work. That investigative work will turn into probabilistic work, which the machine learning can then um, ultimately turn into deterministic. So as new threats come in, we can start moving right, moving things through the funnel, if you will. So as you said, SOC analysts get, really get upskilled. Um, and for if I were a SOC analyst, I would say it's going to be more of the fun work, more of the more challenging work and the um, engaging work. I don't know how fast that's going to happen, but I don't think your job's in danger. I think your job's going to get better. I, I, I have to agree on that one because I, the the thing that I, I've seen and I'm seeing in, in our own work of what we're doing and kind of talking about, um, is it it, I'll throw another term on top of the investigative, probabilistic and the deterministic where we're almost looking at, it's a bit of probabilistic but it's almost a, a percentages game more so than anything else. Um, and, and it's kind of, in my case, the way I look at it is it's sitting above or between the investigative and the, the probabilistic piece of the funnel on, it, it, well, there's lots of things I could talk about at this point, or, and y'all are both smarter <laughs> than me, so I'm not going to go into them much. But the where I'm going with this is I really see the analyst workload moving more towards a advisory role themselves, right? And... So you end up with that percentage decision from an investigative stance of, 
hey, as your as your co-pilot, as your friend or whatever it may be, I think this is 67% right. I think this is 33% right on the other side. Um, you know, you, you here's your evidence, you make the decision, and then over time we're from a model and from an analyst perspective, we're learning together. Uh, that all being said, um, personally for me is I want to see, I want to have fun. I want to see things go slightly sideways. I, I would love for the model to occasionally just stop. There will always be aberrations. Well, no, no, no. I'm not, I'm not saying an aberration. Let me, let me, let me be clear on this. I okay. want the model to stop purposefully. As so you're talking chaos monkey with AI for the sake of for, sport? For no, not for the sake of sport, but as <laughs> one of the things that we know that make a really good analyst, right, or make us good in security is one that that innate sense of curiosity uh, and a little bit of that finger to the eye, like I'm going to mess with this no matter what. Like where a lot of the really good folks in security weren't trained in it because they had to develop it, right? So they just did it and played with it, right? And I don't want the machine to take some of that away. I want the, from an analyst perspective, to be able to, to your point, it needs to be a, a symbiotic relationship where it's checking me and I'm checking it. And the only way that I can really check for hallucination is I understand the basics from the beginning. And I, I think that's part of what I was asserting. Let me frame this differently. So part of the human reinforced learning is, okay, I'm gonna stop reinforcing this deterministic rule and I'm gonna bury you in this, and you're doing this now. The, congratulations, today, you're the wood chipper running through these tickets. But the machine's watching to see how you're scoring, and it's coming back, and someone's gonna check your work because it's not gonna replace its algorithm based upon your behavior today. So one, you're gonna have to do it, but number two, it's going to inform and verify its filters. To my point about aberrations and outliers, it's going to be looking for this. So we're often gonna have, this is where file rule, uh, firewall special rules and stuff would come through. You would apply a rule and the scope was way too broad. You gotta make some adjustments. Well, part of that's machine's job to sanitize and clarify where are the edges, what are the probabilistic edges of where this should be applied. And so forcing that human reinforced le learning, forcing you to work all those tickets confirms, no, this is this is still correct. Am I thinking about this correctly? You are thinking about yeah. it correctly. The, so, the human in the loop um, aspect is not going anywhere. No. You, right, you, need, uh, you need the analyst in the loop. Um, uh, guiding, ultimately guiding the models or guiding the outputs, which guides the models um, to to be better. Models are probabilistic, which means they can always get better. They're never going to be 100%. The more information we're feeding in and the more uh, context we're providing those models, the better. Who's better to do that than the SOC analyst? I think there's a real important point to draw forward here. So you've seen Moneyball. I think most, most uh, stats-minded and tech nerds love Moneyball. For the sake of argument, one of the most fallacious and dangerous things on the planet is an expert. And what the beauty of what this turns into is it's quantifying with volumes and mountains of data, the experts. And at DeepWatch, we talk about the importance of our experts and what we're doing to marry it to technology. But what we're doing is now using the machine to verify via mountains of data to confirm what we see is correct, what we believe is correct is correct. And it's peer review, both horizontally between humans and between human and machine. And the expert is no longer the, the fallible party it's the process that makes the outcome matter right and, and to to that i think we're all in in not quite violent agreement but we're on the same page of it, it and i guess it, it and it kind of roll back to me on, on where i was going with it is the human is never going to be out of the loop no right but you also need to and kind of turn it off take the guide rails off let them see what happens on their own because we know that uh the Discipline equals freedom, right? But consistent activities lead to more myopic or kind of tunnel vision based perspectives. That's not in the model. I don't know what that is. Uh, and in security, we know we are, we're always looking for that next big change. So I, I want that kid to come in and be like, oh, I, that's, that's a new way of looking at that. Like I'm, I worry a little bit about models enforcing a tunnel vision and not allowing that next spark of innovation to, to drop. And that's the, the combination of things I'm, I was trying to get across yeah. with, with what, kind of where you're going. Like there's a human reinforced learning and machine reinforced learning, but at some point in time kind of needs to, to push off. To, no, we, we need to know to push it off to the side to let that spark happen. I don't feel that there's a, sorry, Jason. No, go ahead, please. I don't feel there's a tyranny of or in this scenario. So if we're getting through what are, I'm gonna say easy because I don't have to do the work, but easily identify deterministic outcomes where the rules are enforcing and the machine's running faster. The hunt never stops. 
And so what we're doing is this is the rising tide raises all ships conversation where we're making it more expensive to be evil and malicious. We're making it more dangerous to be evil and malicious. We're catching it faster, which means the machine is now capturing this body of things that we've calibrated and we're checking on, but it's done. The hunt continues. And so you're moving up the stack into more and more important searches and you're upskilled faster where you're starting to look into other things and finding new detections, new correlations, new patterns that matter. And that serves all of our deep watch customers laterally across all of our socks, but the search never stops. And so, you know, for me as a capacity planning and business continuity concept, I'm wondering what happens if the machines take a nap, we got to worry about that. But on the other end of the spectrum, I'm asking the question, where does the hunt stop? And the hunt never stops. We find evil. That's what we do. And so if the machine's looking for that pattern, we're done look at that pattern for a hot minute. What, like what, what thoughts have we seen? What else is an aberration of where do we go find it? The hunt never stops. Yeah, what happens when a threat actor, uh, you know, has malicious activity that stops working because uh, there's now a deterministic rule that stops it? Like water, they go to the next thing. They move on. Move on. That's yeah. right. So, right, and this is exactly right. Um, why this this cat and mouse game right will continue to happen. Um, uh, the other area uh, in which which plays in is new threat detection, right? And so uh, one of the places I think where SOC analysts will spend more time, I hope, um, is on that new threat detection. And there are there are um, uh, methods, right? Uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning methodologies that can be used uh, to help identify potential new threats um, or segments of threats that the SOC analysts can go investigate, but it still takes that investigative knowledge um, in order to then categorize them appropriately um, and start building uh, more rules around them, whether probabilistic or deterministic. So this process is going to continue, right? Um, as far as I can tell forever. Yeah. I mean, uh Security to me always comes down to it's a human against another human, right? All we're doing in this case is you're learning to play chess against the machine. Then you got to go play chess against a human. Uh, and that, that's really on, on both sides. Um, and I think that's, that. again, I'm really excited for this and, and seeing what's coming because we, it's just going to start happening faster. Um, and the one thing that, I personally believe that we can all be looking at um, from a security aspect is being a little bit more organized, being a little bit more consistent. You know, I'll use that line again, like discipline equals freedom, like being, you know, we know what's going on, but also to, to your, you know, to, to end it on the joke, uh, but the truth, right? If I can be regimented in my constitutional, then it knows when my behavior is the most, uh, the most vulnerable, right? And so I can, even in my own volition, like I'm, I'm going to make sure that I'm, I'm at least cognizant in my head of, I'm not clicking on that right now. I'm going to go back to my stupid mobile game or, Hey, what, what what's more recent on Amazon that I might not need in my life tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so on, on that note, really do appreciate you guys dropping in. Uh, I thought that was a fun conversation. Uh, I don't know if y'all enjoyed it or not. Thanks hopefully, for having me. Absolutely. Man. Yeah. Thank you. Hopefully I didn't Great. make a fool of myself. Y'all have fun. Uh, uh, and, uh, watch out for the, uh, for the next one of these coming down the pipe. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Have a pleasant day. Bye, y'all.